might have broken in right at this moment in the middle of a very important parable. <laughs> I could just hear it now. And so, and so due to the evil that was in her heart, Lot's wife was made into a pillar of salt. A big roar of applause. <laughs> What a terrible bunch. Uh, you know, before we get started here, you know, it's just it's an awful. I'm looking down. All of you out there in the darkness, I'm looking down on a scene of debauchery, which any man of goodwill will be sickened at. As far as the eye can see, I can see people eating cheeseburgers, which, by the way, is the American's idea of one of the more ultimate sins. Speaking of sin, oh, yeah, the Americans are very conscious of this. How many of you have seen that recent commercial? Shows this guy. See, a little short, fat guy. He's looking kind of nervous. And here's his wife. She's one of these razor-sharp TV wives. You know, the kind with the sharp face? And they're always on top of it. They're always telling their husband to stop using the detergent on the floor that isn't as good as the green one. By the way, I want to ask some of you here a question. How many of you find yourself using that second-rate green cleaner? That's what I thought. I could tell it by looking at your shirts. Yeah, you know, there are some of us who are really worried about that kind of stuff, and there's this great commercial. You know, I think the old idea of sin has completely disappeared. I mean, let's face it. We have discovered now that sex is an art form. We discovered that through Swedish movies. <laughs> yeah, you know. I'm great, you know, oh yeah, I'm very innocent. I, I remember the first time I went to a Swedish movie. And I had just come to New York. And our idea of movies out in Indiana, you know, at Doris Day, and the Rock Hudson. I mean, that's a movie. I came to New York, you know, the first week I'm here, I go to a Swedish movie. We didn't get Swedish movies out there. And I read in the New Yorker, it says, a stunning evocation of man's search for the lost vacuity of erotic pleasure. <laughs> Stunning evocation. What's that? that sounds pretty dirty. And you know, I didn't know what it was. I thought, you know, it's, just, it's a magnificently photographed Ingmar Bergman. And I go to this movie and I, uh, these guys are all looking out from behind doors. Everything is dark. And I see there's a quick shot of this bed. And then there's a shot of a Venetian blind. And then there's a tank running past outside in the darkness. And one guy looks at the other guy, and they all have these sunken cheeks. And one goes, ay, 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 ay. And the first one goes, ay, 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 ay. Ay, 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 ay. And underneath it, it says, hello, Fred. <laughs> and, and what bugs me is that I, oh, yeah, this is one of the most maddening things in New York theater and movie going is to sit in the middle of a movie house, you know, you're sitting there, you were told to see it by the village boys. I mean, they said, you have to see this. Required course. I mean, you know, and required courses are always such a drag. And so you sit in the middle of this Greek movie and you hear the banjos playing or it's, maybe it's Yugoslavia. That's, they're getting more esoteric. In fact, I saw a movie the other night that was done in Croatian. It was dubbed in the Yugoslavian. It had Finnish subtitles. And then, it, running over it, they had put American voices. And so I hear the... And instantly, five guys up on the balcony start laughing. Do they know Croatian? Or is it Yugoslavian they're digging? And, you know, I've learned how to do this now. Oh, you, you, really, this is... You, all of us New Yorkers, real New Yorkers, have learned about 5,000 little one-up tricks. So now I'll go to uh, Cinema 6SJ7. It's up on 58th Street. You know, I'll wait in line five hours to get inside and sit down. And the first thing comes out, and you, you notice all sex scenes are accompanied by a quick shot of the ocean with waves on the wall, you know, going... By the way, I've always waited for that to happen in my life. <laughs> no wonder half of us think that it's never really happened to us. It only happens to Michael Caine. 
And, and there's always a shot of the ocean going, and I hear this guy talking. He says, immediately they start singing a Swedish folk song. And I start laughing. And instantly, five guys turn around and say, who is he? He's a New Yorker. He's in. He understands all the little ins and outs. But part of the understanding of the in and out of our world, and by the way, I might point out in just one hour and 26 minutes, we are going to begin a national holiday. And it's, it's yeah, I got, a, I got a whole promotional thing on it, a great big brochure with a seven color folder. And it said, don't forget, beginning this Sunday at midnight begins in America, the first annual traditional the first annual traditional American Art Appreciation Week. I think I'll go out and appreciate a little art tonight <laughs> after the show. <laughs> and, and, you know, I thought to myself, National Art Appreciation Week. And instantly there was a little thing inside of my, a little sick thing. Because I remember Mrs. Oschenschlager, who was our art teacher. How many of you had art in school? No wonder Americans hate art, because they got art teachers. And I remember Mrs. Oschenschlager, she was the typical, you might say, the standard model art teacher. She had a burlap skirt. You know, she made herself at a high thirndle type thing, you know, in a peasant blouse, and she had 36 bracelets. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> And you know, they all jingled, and she was always suntan. She was always brown. She had these great big ceramic earrings that looked like footballs. You know, and she would come into art class, and all of us would sit, see? And she would come in, dingle, dingle, doing, doing, clank. <laughs> Clink, clank, clank, doing, ding. And here is our little group, our little group of Americans. 36 of us. We're in 4B. <laughs> I mean, you know, 4B, that's about as humble as you can get. I mean, somehow 4A sounds better. And here we are in 4B, and me and Schwartz and Flick, Bruner, Helen Weathers, Alec Joshaway, George Doppler. We're all sitting back in the back of the room, see? We were so far, we, we belong to the ghetto department of 4B. <laughs> now, for those of you who don't know this, you know that in the back of every room, no matter where you go, there is a group of rabble. <laughs> These are people whose names are from S to Z. I mean, and they go through life, you know, never getting called on. Never seeing the board. <laughs> Always at the end of every chow line. Every pay line. You know, they used to, I remember even in Company K, we lined up for chow alphabetically. And I can remember always, right about the middle of the, let's see, it was about L, M, N, O, P, about Q, about the middle of R. Right about the middle of R, they would run out of fried chicken. <laughs> and me and Zinsmeister. <laughs> I remember the KPs would come out and they'd have this great big tray full of coal cuts. Now the army has a special name for that. <laughs> you know, you'll have to explain that when you get home. You know, make sure she's over 21. And, and, and yeah, I remember standing back there and, and, and Zinsmeister hit me in the ribs. He says, Braga Gaga again. I said, yeah. And ever since that time, I've always had a vague, just a vague ambition to see an A&P ad. <laughs> you know, on the weekend, <laughs> big weekend Saturday specials, <laughs> and it says, uh, Braga Braga special. <laughs> 87 million GI say, man, let's go down, you know. <laughs> How would you like to arrive at Shraff some afternoon? It says number three, SOS. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
SOS a la King. <laughs> you know? What was that? <laughs> what the hell's he doing here? You should be up down listening to Henny Youngman. <laughs> he's, he, oh, that is. That that is. That is. You'll be out on the street quicker than you bargain for, it, kid. All right. That is. And you know, I, I remember Mrs. Ossenschlager, seriously, arriving in class, and this is the way art is taught to kids in Indiana in 4B. Mrs. Ossenschlager would come in and you'd hear her dingling all down the hall. And I would sit there. See, she came in once a week, always on Wednesday afternoon, right after Miss Nelson had finished reading us Raggedy Ann and Raggedy Andy. <laughs> And Miss Nelson, who was our 4B teacher, would say, Now don't forget, get out your Crayolas. <laughs> I, wonder, I wonder if there's any major artists today who work in the Crayola medium. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, how many of you got so that you really enjoyed eating Crayolas? <laughs> well, for the benefit of those of you who have never tried them, the green are the best. <laughs> Yeah, they taste a little like asparagus. They're very good. And, 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 and I remember Miss Nelson saying, Now, children, don't forget, it's Wednesday and it's art day. And she would leave the room and you'd hear dingle, 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 dingle. And in would come Mrs. Oschenschlag. And she had that pure light. I'm sure she thought that she was a fantastic teacher. You know, she's the kind of lady who writes articles for parents on how to get the kids interested in art, you know, and it says, involve them. And she would come in, and her eyes would be lit like two little candles. And I'd look up there, and she had, by the way, she had silver filling in her teeth. It was Mayan silver. <laughs> and she looked out, you know, she was just made, and she, you could see, though, underneath it all, there was that look in the eye and I, you know, I didn't realize it at the time, but now looking back on it, I can see that sadness in the eye of a lady who always felt somehow that her true home was the Museum of Modern Art. You know, and here she is stuck in the Warren G. Harding School in Hammond, Indiana. <laughs> By the way, isn't that a great name for a school? Yeah. Warren G. Harding, the worst president. <laughs> I mean, this guy made all other presidents look like statesmen. You know, Warren G. Harding, all he was good for was for pigeons to sit on. And, you know, and, and, oh yes, we had this great big coat of arms, the Warren G. Harding school, you know, had a teapot dome. <laughs> With money dropping out of it, you know. Oh yeah, and so, so this is... <laughs> Mrs. Oschenschlager, Mrs. Oschenschlager would walk in, you know, she would dingle all the way, and she'd stand up in front of the class, and she'd radiate. You know how music teachers and art teachers are? And, and later on in school, you learn that the drama teachers are like this, too. They've all got that secret sorrow. They all one time thought of themselves as painters. Some of them thought of themselves as actresses. Others were going to go on and become great pianists. And now they've got this little mass of grubby people just sitting there looking. I'd sit next to Schwartz, see. And Schwartz would say, I remember Schwartz would always say, he'd say, let's draw a picture. I said, okay, Schwartz. And Schwartz, they give you that manila paper? And Schwartz would take out his Crayolas. <laughs> Folding it up, he'd pass it to me. Schwartz was a very good artist. As a matter of fact, Schwartz was a good 20 years ahead of his time. I mean, Schwartz discovered sexual freedom very early. And, I mean, he was way ahead of Warhol. And Schwartz would draw these pictures, and I'll never forget the time Schwartz handed me this little piece of manila paper, and he had this great picture drawn on it, 
and under it, it said Eileen Akers. <laughs> well, Eileen Akers was the beautiful girl in our class. There's always one. And she was absolutely remote. And Eileen Akers, because her name started with an A, always sat in the front of the class. Eileen Akers, Esther Jane Alberry, all of the important people. Ed Schwartz, and me, and Zinsmeister. All we ever saw was the back of the heads of these girls. And so Schwartz drew the front. Well, I might add that his knowledge of biology was shaky. <laughs> At that point, see. <laughs> Later on, it got very good. In fact, he went to reform school for a year and a half. <laughs> got that good. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so, you know, he hands me this drawing, see, and I take a look at it and says, Wow! And Mrs. Oschenschlager said, And now, let us see what all of you have drawn. Well, you know, it was terrible. You know how the teacher walks along, and I'm trying to get rid of this drawing, and she grabs a hold of it, and she took a look at it, and I'm sick. Oh, God, no. I'm just sitting there. And Schwartz next to me, and he's cackling. He's got a picture of a pumpkin in front of him. You know? And she looks at me and she says, that's very good. I said, yeah. She's very surrealistic. And you know, that was the day that I got my reputation in the class as an artist. I find that most reputations are phony anyway. And you know, you know, this thing of art, this vague thing that's always bugging all of us. I wonder how many people, you know, one thing I learned about the Museum of Modern Art, it is the greatest make-out place in New York. <laughs> right, guy? Oh, man. And you know, you learn all kinds of things. So you walk around a museum, you got to get yourself a pair of chino pants. You know, and the best time to go is at 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the afternoon because the place is filled with out-of-work actors, all kinds of people like that, see. And you walk around. This is truly functional art. I mean, it's art that means something. I mean, it, it actually produces results. And so you go into the place, you see, and you walk in, you develop this stony-eyed look. You stand, you know, in front of this magnificent drawing. You know, it's 17 feet across. And it shows the inner viscal working of a new. You know, it's, it's called blood and guts. <laughs> you look at this thing. And there's always a girl standing halfway through making notes. I mean, have you ever wondered about those mysterious notes that these girls make? And they're always wearing these blue jeans and they're always frantically making notes. Well, you stand next to this chick, and you say, eh. he's gone commercial. <laughs> Twenty minutes later, all you got to worry about is how to get out of her apartment. <laughs> so there's all kinds of tricks. You learn these things in New York, you know. And, and, and as an old art lover from way back, I say that the only art form... Now, we've got to be very serious tonight because, we're, we're, you know, it's part of American Art Appreciation Week. By the way, how about let's all of us giving art three big cheers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's give them a big cheer. He's been trying so hard tonight. <laughs> Nothing is sadder than an unsuccessful heckler. <laughs> you know, the poor guy, you know, his teeth keep falling out. You know, but seriously, though, 
since we are Americans, I want to say that the art of any given time is never appreciated until later generations come on the scene. Now, I'm sure some guy sitting in the middle of a pile of dust way down in Italy someplace 4,000 years ago, and he's making this spittoon. <laughs> he's working away with it, you know. He's a spittoon maker, you know. He's, you know, he's working away. Little did he realize that he was an Etruscan. And what was worse, he was considered a third-rate spittoon maker. <laughs> and he's making these spittoons there, you know. And, and you know, his name, by the way, was Archimedes L. Etruscan. <laughs> and he would put on the bottom of every one of his spittoons, Etruscan, <laughs> in these strange letters, you see. Well, it took, it took the people at the university of Pennsylvania in cooperation with the British Museum of Archaeology I never knew they sweated I guess his jockey shorts are tight but you know it took them, it took them over 200 years to decipher Etruscan and it became known as the Etruscan Civilization. And somewhere the moldering bones of Archimedes L. Etruscan, spit tool maker, are now immortal. And two of his spittoons are worth over $17,000 apiece. Well, now you see, at, at the time, there were guys who were working, I'm sure, in what later became known as the Etruscan civilization, there were guys who were working and people were lining up to look at their junk. Oh yeah, and it was, it was called deathless, immortal. And way down at the end of the street, this little klutz, he was pounding out the spittoons and they were selling them at the local Woolworth. And now he has done it. Well, <laughs> who among us is Mr. Etruscan tonight? Well, I would like to submit, I would like to submit my theory of what will be admired as a true American art form in the year 4950. I mean, long after America has moldered into the dust and other civilizations have risen and fallen one after the other until finally there is not even the slightest trace of the externals of our time left. And archaeologists will be digging deep. There will be a big dig, a real big dig, you know, and they'll be digging 75 feet deep. And they dig through all these various layers of civilizations, the 3,500-year level, the 2,900-year level, the 2,700-year level, and now they're down around Hackensack. <laughs> and they're way down there, see? And a guy is digging away there, and all of a sudden he says, Halt! Halt! Stop! Halt! Halt! And they all gather around, and there, lying there amid the dust, the only thing that's left of all of the stuff that we've built, millions and millions of things, Henry Moore has disappeared. Jackson Pollock has molded. All that is left is a concrete Mexican. <laughs> and they stand around, you know, and they say, my God, that's beautiful. What, what scope? What daring? What boldness? And underneath it, it says Corvette. <laughs> in this very strange script that says Corvette. And 200 years later, they finally decipher it, and it becomes known as the Corvette Civilization. 
Don't laugh. I mean, can you see it now, you know, at this museum? All the lights are playing on it, and here's this little concrete Mexican. And he's wearing a little concrete sombrero, and he's leading a little concrete burro, and he's wearing a little concrete serape. A few little flecks of paint are still remaining. And E.J. Corbett and the concrete Mexican, the concrete Mexican culture will forever be in the books. And we will join Mr. Etruscan. And probably right now, at this very minute, some resident of New Jersey sitting out there in, let's say, a little town like East Fairlawn. I mean, a simple little hubble. I mean, you know, he's got a color TV set that's over 75 feet across. <laughs> you know, his wife hasn't had a new dress since 1949. And the two of them are sitting out on the front porch, Charlie and Gus. And Charlie looks over, you know, his wife, Gussie. He says, Gussie, baby, we got it all. I mean, the kids are in school now. Yeah, little Clarence is up at Rutgers. <laughs> and I hope he dies for Rutgers. <laughs> that way, you know, we'll have a little peace around the house. <laughs> Charlie's at Rutgers, you know. Here we are, we got it all, we're getting kind of old. We got the Plymouth Fury paid for. <laughs> By the way, isn't that one of the saddest things how we attach to the sides of cars little emotions <laughs> like fury that most of us are totally incapable of. I like to see, you know, in my mind's eye, I see this little chinless man with rimless glasses. He's been standing in front of the Holland Tunnel for over two and a half hours in his blood red Plymouth Fury. And the Jersey crud is drifting down on the hood. And all he is capable of is a faint mewing sound. <laughs> but his car says, Fury! Oh, I see the day when you'll be able to buy a Ford Lust. <laughs> yeah, let's give it a hand. <laughs> or, or, or even better than that, what about the Lincoln Narcissus? <laughs> has mirror sides, you know, and you look 40 feet tall when you stand next to it. And you want to hear what happened to Charlie and the Concrete Mexican? We'll be back in 10... Well, let's hear it. We'll be back in five minutes. <laughs> dinner for Richard M. Nixon. And, <laughs> you see how easy things are done, friends? <laughs> you know, don't, don't you... <laughs> I mean, somehow, I, you know, I don't like to get particularly political, but don't you somehow feel a little sorry for Nixon? What do you say all of us together just all say, aww? Once again now, for Dick Nixon, if he's listening. Oh, <laughs> oh man, there's always one Barry Goldwater man who walks out. <laughs> How about McKinley? Yeah. <laughs> How about giving Millard Fillmore a hand? Yeah. All right, at ease, at ease, kids. At ease. You're looking at a duty corporal now. And I know just how to get you in the kidney, kid. You know, at, now wait a minute, fella. At ease, at ease. You know, I'll tell you one more thing, though, about this art business. 
And I, 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 I am vaguely now always afraid to ever say anything about, about anybody's taste in art because of a thing that once happened to me, which sometimes at 3 o'clock in the morning, I wonder how many of you have got things like this in your, you know, your little private world. Inside of each man is this, this, this little auditorium. It's deep down in his subconscious. And in that auditorium are thousands of people, characters that he knew, moments, little incidents. And usually the lights are turned off in that auditorium. You know, you walk around during the day and you got your attache case. You're going out to lunch. You're wearing your, you know, your new suit from Corvettes. You're looking very official. You're walking down Fifth Avenue and you've got your attache case and it looks very official. Inside of it, you've got three Twinkies. <laughs> you know, you like to mix it up. You've got two banana Twinkies and one vanilla. Oh, yeah, you know, it's terrible. I, 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 you know, I, I've got... I, I, I must say that I am, I have truly the taste of a genuine slob. No, I, 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 sometimes you just have to admit it. I'm sitting in places like once in a while I go to these, these French restaurants, you know, like La Miserable du Frite. You know, like La Miserable du Mort. You know, and I'm sitting in these places and I'm with a whole bunch of very official looking ad men, you know, and they're all flashing their credit cards. You know, the waiter comes over and says, would you care for anything to drink? And instantly, there's a little thing in my, inside of me that wants to say, you. <laughs> yeah, don't order strawberry you at Le Marmiton. And you know, after a while, you know what, after they've had the, the sole amandine a la Provençal, all that stuff, you know, and you're burping a little bit. You, know, you feel fat and sloppy and rotten. You sit down and they come over and they say, would you care to order from the dessert menu? And everybody is ordering these things like Mocha Normandy. And you want to say Twinkie. <laughs> Just bring me a Twinkie. <laughs> Don't unwrap it. I'll unwrap it. How many of us actually hate good food? <laughs> I mean, that's what, I mean, we're secretly mainlining Mexican TV dinners. <laughs> you know, I wish I liked good stuff, you know. <laughs> you know, I keep trying to read good books. I, I, no, seriously, for over four weeks, I actually tried to read Giles Goat Boy. <laughs> <laughs> there's, an, uh, there's a fellow victim. <laughs> well, uh, for over three weeks, I would start to read this, you know, and my head would start, you know, I'd hear this little buzzing, and I'm always sitting on a Fifth Avenue bus, and it would always begin with my left foot. It would, it would fall asleep first. And it starts working up the left side, you know, and I've got Giles Goat Boy, and I carry it. You know, it's got a great big thing on the front, and I, and I, like, to get the, I like to get the second or the third editions when the quotes are in, and they print it on the dust jacket. You know, it says, Unparalleled Academic Literary Achievement. It says, Barkham. Or it says, uh, New York Review of Books. Holy smokes. <laughs> you know, you know, I like, and so I sit there, see, and for three weeks, I carry that thing around with me, you know, and right now, it is in my office and is serving as a doorstop. <laughs> it's very good at that, see. Well, about three weeks after I tried this, you know, I always go back to my original literature. You know, it's always a book that starts out, come here, baby. <laughs> Charlie ripped her bra from her pulsating body. <laughs> you know, that's the kind of stuff. I stick it inside a Giles Goat Boy dust jacket. <laughs> I mean, the two authors are talking about the same thing, you know. It's a matter of style, see. 
You know, I, I, I've always tried to like good stuff. You know, secretly at night, I sit there and I actually enjoy Lee Tracy movies. You know, and I, I read in the New Yorker, you know, talks all about these guys that look at the late night movies as a camp exercise. You know, as an exercise in putting down the world. And I'm sitting there and I am digging Jack Oakey. <laughs> I mean, I like him, you know, when he comes out and says, there's no business like show. I get all goosebumps all over me, you know, and I feel real sick. All of a sudden he goes off the screen and on comes the preparation H man. <laughs> What a great combination. Jack Oakey and the Preparation H man. You know. And June Allison is lurking in the background there, you know. And I like that book that the Preparation H man carries. You know, the one that says, guaranteed to relieve itching. And it says on the outside, medical proof. Now, I'd love to have that book. I'd sit there and read about the itching, you know. I wish I had a good mind, you know? I, I mean, whenever I see that commercial, I always imagine them, you know, medically proving it. You know, I see this doctor with a clipboard, you know, walking around, he's got a white coat, and all these people in these little pens. And he keeps, uh oh, number three, scratching again. I know. <laughs> And down at the end is this stalwart man, you know, wearing this T-shirt that says Preparation H, and he never once scratches. <laughs> I mean, have you ever noticed the good taste in our commercials? Have you ever noticed, how about that one, you ever see that one with the two rolls? And you know they're unrolling? And it starts out and says, and they're off and running at the big A. You know? Now I ask you, friends, how would it be if that is the only thing that remains of our civilization? I mean, you know. <laughs> By the way, I've always thought that the commercial... <laughs> oh, there's some other great taste commercials on now that I think about it. How about the guy that's in the party, see? And they're getting ready for the party. Have you seen that one? And he's standing here, he's looking a little nervous. And there's his wife, and she's talking to her friend. And her friend says, what's the matter with Clarence? And she says, well, you know, Clarence is nervous about the party. See, he's nervous about perspiration odor. I mean, and Clarence is nervous about the party because of perspiration odor. And later on in the second scene, we see him, you know, and he's got a paper hat on the top of his head. You know, he's got a horn, he's blowing, he's swinging with nine chicks. And the girl says to the wife, gee, I see Clarence having a good time. He says, yes, thanks to you, and I found the secret. <laughs> I mean, you know, I remember the days when they used to have an ad that would say, are you a dud at the party? It says, wouldn't you like to amaze and mystify your friends by sitting down at the piano and playing? Now, today, all you got to do is smell good. And you're a success. You know, one of the saddest commercials of all is this one, you know, the fantastically sexy one that shows this guy, and it's got sort of a sharp looking, you know, the guys today don't get haircuts. Their hair is coiffed and sculpted. He's got a $17 coif. You know, you can see this. He's got this high suit buttoned all the way down, Victorian. And you see him ringing that bell. You seen that one? And the bell lights up, and the door opens, and there's this fantastic party going on. And it's all shot like Elliot Elisafan, you know, and it's all color and shifting Picasso forms. And you see this girl, look at him. And he looks in, and the voice says, yeah, it's going to be a good night. It's going to be a good night. Oh, and you work up a thirst on a good night. The first gulp is for thirst. Boom. And the second one is for kicks. And he's drinking ginger ale. Can you imagine a guy whose life is so sad that he drinks ginger ale for kicks? I mean, that tells the truth. And so one day, you know, I'm, I'm sitting there in the darkness of my old pad, 
and I'm sort of half drowsing off. It's two, three o'clock in the morning, and I say that one of the great social forces in this country today, and it's never been pointed out yet as a social force, and I seriously believe it is, is this is the first time in history that people could look at their own past every night and simultaneously live in the present. This produces a schizoid condition that does not stop. Oh, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm serious. Years ago, when an old movie was done, after it played two weeks at the Orpheum, where they gave away the dishes, you know, and they played Kino, you never heard of it again. It disappeared forever. But now, every third week, it shows up on Channel 2. Every third week, and next to it is an R. Rerun. You damn betcha. That thing has run so many times on Channel 2, it hasn't got sprocket holes. There's three guys slide it through, you know. You can just tell it, you know, whatever channel it is at three in the morning, you turn it on, and all of a sudden, out of the hazy darkness, comes all these images. And the other day, I'm sitting there, say it's two o'clock in the morning, and who walks out on the screen but George Brent? George Brent. Uh, you know, he had this little thin mustache, and he's wearing this G.I. suntan hat, and he's got on these G.I. suntans. And it's George Brent. And who is he with? He's with his sidekick. He's with Preston Foster. <laughs> you know? And Preston Foster and George Brent are going into a PX. All of a sudden, I'm awake, see? I look at that PX. I said, my God, I know that PX. Yeah, there it is. There's the cash register. I remember, and over there is the counter behind which that chick used to stand and tell us that they had no Milky Ways. <laughs> oh, yeah. The PXs are classical. See, and I'm watching this thing. And I'm sitting there. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. I'm all by myself. The Preparation H man has departed. <laughs> and that little wriggly spearmint man with the pointed head. You know that little guy that comes on and says, Double your pleasure, double your fun. Chew. Double mint, double mint. Every night I see that, I say to myself, God, if only that would work. <laughs> Can't you just see this? In the middle of this, this very dramatic moment, she said, what are you doing? Show it, gum. Well, I saw it on TV. <laughs> but I try it. <laughs> so life really isn't so easy, you know, in the 20th century. You're always being you're always being beset by thousands and thousands of temptations. And I see this PX. Well, let me tell you, I had a thing happen to me one time in a PX that I will never forget, and it's directly connected with this art scene. Up to that time, you know, I'm 17. I go in the army, you know. 17 years old, I'm right out of high school. Ah, oh, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm away from home. And by the way, I have found in actual practice, in spite of what guys write home, and in spite of what the movies tell you, that almost any guy that leaves to go to the army digs it. He likes the idea of split, you know, and, and he's all by himself. And you know, oh yeah, guys spend years later saying to, to, to chicks they meet, oh no, no, I hated it. Boy, they'd have to drag me out of here to get me away. Why, I'd, I'd dig a hole in the mountains. And there's a little thing that says, oh yeah. Man, if they, if they drafted you back as a PFC, you could split out of this whole damn mess. You could leave the whole scene. J.J. Bullard. You could leave the widget account. You could go all the way, man, and then you could go back to Neosho, Missouri. Let me tell you about that. I am watching this movie, see? And there's the PX. And I see George Brent walk over, and he's talking to his friend Robert Walker. 
you know, who always played the happy private. You know, he was always the guy with the hat turned up, you know, and all that stuff. By the way, there is no private ever in the Army like any genuine Hollywood private. I was in at least 50 companies while I was in the Army, and never once did I ever meet the guy who sat around, you know, like uh, Edmund J. O'Brien. You know, Edmund O'Brien is always playing the Brooklyn private. He's always saying, oh, you guys ought to see them Brooklyn Dodgers. Oh, there's nothing. The first day when I get back, I'm going to go to Ebbets Field. And I'm going to cheer on the Dodgers. I was in the Army three years. I never met that guy. He's in every movie. Was I in the wrong army? <laughs> yeah, all of us in Company K used to feel very, very inferior because we never had the guys they've got in the movies. For example, we never had a second lieutenant like Van Johnson. You know, Van Johnson always came into the company and he was replacing this beloved officer and nobody liked him in the, in the company. And his whole idea was to get loved. Later on, since he is from the South, he will be rescued by Sidney Poitier. <laughs> who plays a lovable sergeant. You know, and he rescues this Southern bigot. Well, our, our, you know, my company didn't have any of those guys. Just had a whole bunch of guys. Schwartz, you know, Gassers, Zinsmeister were just walking around. Once in a while I'd try talking, you know, like I was from Brooklyn. I'd say, hey, how about the Brooklyn Dodgers? <laughs> Nobody heard of them in Company K. You know? And so I watched this scene. And here's Preston Foster. And here's George Brent. And they walk past this counter. And I peer into the TV set. And by God, there they were. On the screen. The very thing that caused me to get my you-know-what in a sling. <laughs> and for the next two years in my regiment, I was so far up the proverbial creek that an outboard motor wouldn't help me. <laughs> and it happened just very innocently. See, I'm sitting around in a Ferex one day. Now, now, one of the major art forms that we work in, that is a true art, folk art form, is killing time. <laughs> Oh yeah, a lot of guys, it, 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 it's a real art form, and in the Army, it becomes a major preoccupation. In fact, I remember sitting in Company K's barracks, and Gas is over here on his bunk. I'm sitting on the side of mine, and across the aisle is Edwards. He's sitting there. We got our t-shirts on. You know, our GI shorts, dog tags. And you can smell the butt cans. We had these butt cans at each end of the barracks. And the same butts had been in there since the Boer War. <laughs> and you could smell the fatigues. In fact, every barrack, every bunk had two pair of fatigues hanging that had not been in the laundry for eight weeks. And sometimes in the dark, you could hear them talking to each other. <laughs> Oh, yeah, the fatigues, you know. I had a pair of fatigues, believe me, that had twigs under the arms. <laughs> uh, you know, there were moss growing up and down the back. And at night, I could hear them crawling up and down. And so we're sitting on the edge of the barracks, and we're working in boredom. You know, you can actually, in, in, in the Army, when you're sitting on the edge of your bunk, you're in the barracks, you know, and there's never, never once did I ever see that thing that you see in every Army movie. You know the guy that slams open the door and hollers, Hey, fellas, what do you say? He's always Donald O'Connor. <laughs> He's got this big grin, you know, and his buddy is Eddie Albert. He says, Hey, fellas, what do you say? What do you say? We put on a show. <laughs> and ten minutes later, they're all dancing, see? They're putting on a show and they're wearing mops on their head. I've seen that in 500 army movies. I mean, somehow, in every movie they put out, you know, they got skirts and they're all doing like this. Now, I wonder whether, because I never saw this once in the army. 
I wonder whether that's a comment on guys who make army pictures. I mean, here's their chance to do it legally. You know, they got the mops and they're all, they got the things on, you know. And, and, and I'll never forget one time Gasser tried it. I mean, we're all saying, yeah, this is an actual moment in the Army. I'll tell you, a real moment. This, this really actually happened. A whole bunch of us, we've been together now about two and a half years, this company. We've been overseas. We've been on the boondocks. We've been in the swamps. And one night, we had this Quonset hut. The door slams open, and in walks Gasser. He's got heat rash. He had heat rash. You could see it in the air above him. You know, he, we all had heat rash. In fact, our major hobby at that time was just scratching. <laughs> oh, yeah, you get so you like your heat rash. You sit there, gives you something to do at night. I'd sit there, you know, and scratch. And Gasser had heat rash. It started, and it went all the way down the back of his head and his arms and stuff. And he had this tattered pair of GI shorts. His dog tags were rusty. <laughs> his eyes were hollow with the horrors that we had seen. You know, 500,000 clock hours trying to run this rotten, crummy, surplus TV, miserable radar set. Gasser walks in one night and looks. And down at the end of the barracks, Edwards was laying in his bunk, just moaning. I mean, when, whenever we were off, we were four hours on and four hours off. And when you were off, you just lay in your bunk. What's the why? You go, oh. <laughs> You've got no sympathy because everybody else was doing it, you know? Yeah. And you'd lie there. Once in a while, you'd go and you'd stand and you'd look at the latrine. <laughs> yeah, then, you know, it used to be great. Once in a while, just for kicks, to ch just kind of give you a little change in the routine, you'd go down and you'd flush toilets. <laughs> you'd watch the water come up and down, you know? It's all pork. All mixed together. Yeah, that's the way the army serves it. And so Gasser walks in, see, and he stands in the barracks for one minute and he's dripping sweat. The temperature is 140 degrees in the Quonset hut. And down at the end, you can hear Edwards going, oh. And I look up, see, and I've got this. <laughs> Every guy in the army finds a little thing that's his thing that keeps him from going out of his skull. Some guys through seven years of the army just rub their shoe. These are the shoe shiners. Other guys rub a little belt buckle. Hour after hour. And there's always one guy at the end of the barracks, one sort of gray, thin guy who never says anything to anybody. And he sits and he writes an interminable letter. He just sits there. Never says a word. And there we are. Our little company is living. And Gasser walks in and looks at this crowd. Says, hey, fellas. Hey, fellas. Let's put on a show. <laughs> and Edward goes, oh. And so, you know, that scene never actually occurs in real life. But the kind of scenes that really do occur never show up in the movies. One day, I'm sitting in the barracks, and this is in a big camp. Great big camp. I'm 17. You know, I'm really on top of it, see. Oh, I've, you know, I've been all through basic. And now I've been assigned to my final company. And, and just the day before, we had had our indoctrination speech. Now, that's always good. I mean, you never see this in the movies either. Company K had come together for the first time. And we're now sitting in the post theater. Each one of us, a tin hat. We got our big 78 pound field pack on our back. Each one of us has got his M1. We're sitting. And I didn't know the guy next to me. His name was Gasser. He was just sitting. And he, I'd never met him before. I'm sitting down there by myself waiting. I don't know anybody in this outfit. And all of a sudden, Gasser comes out with this word. Ego. It was the only word that Gasser used 
for over three years in the army. He used it in over a thousand different ways. He used it as an adjective, as an adverb. He even used it as a comma. <laughs> I mean, you know, he was magnificent with this word, you know. And, and already, he's only been in the army eight weeks and he's already got it going, see. We're all sitting there and out walks this guy who I will never forget. I don't know where he is today. If he's listening, I'm in trouble. <laughs> out walks Lieutenant Cherry. He comes out and he's sharp and bright. You know, he's out of, he's out of the ROTC. And he's been in the army eight weeks. And he's got these pinks that he got from Brooks Brothers. He's got this sharp green coat. Great big hat with the birds and the eagles and the bars. He walks out in front of us, and little did we know, we were meeting the albatross. I mean, we didn't see the claws. When he first walked out there, you couldn't see his feathers. In fact, later on, whenever he came on the scene, somebody went... Bark, 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 bark. <laughs> Oh, yeah, old chicken, old chicken cherry. And he walks out there and he looks down on the company, see. We're meeting him for the first time. And he had been through all these indoctrination courses on how to be an officer. You know, and, and one of the things they say, when you, when you have to be an officer, you must speak with authority. You must speak clearly and loudly. And let the men know that you are in charge. We're I mean, this poor, sad little group. A cherry walks in. Men's. <laughs> Men's of Company K of the 362nd Signal Airborne Mess Kit Repair Battalion. <laughs> I was in a handle platoon. <laughs> Men's, we got the best damn mess kit repair battalion in the whole army, right? <laughs> I said, let's hear it, right? Right. <laughs> That's better. <laughs> now, men. I am a second lieutenant, and by God, I'll tell you this, before, before this company leaves for overseas, I'm going to be a first lieutenant. And you're going to make me a first lieutenant, right? And by the time we get to where we're going and we're there for one month, I'm going to be a captain, right? They never have this scene in the movies. <laughs> then he walks back and forth and he says, Men, first of all, I want to say this to you, that if you play ball with me, <laughs> I was to hear that 229,000 times. <laughs> if you play ball with me, I'll play ball with you. Poor old Company K for the next three years played ball. <laughs> so we did toss that softball back and forth, waiting for the lieutenant to get into our little game of catch. And he walked back and forth. And he said, I want to tell you one thing. We got a colonel in this outfit. The colonel's over our regiment. There's a man that all of you are going to be proud to go through hell for. <laughs> I've always wanted to go through hell for Colonel. You know? And we sat there for about 10 minutes, and Gasser slowly falls asleep. <laughs> and his tin hat kept hitting me on the shoulder. <laughs> You know, and, and it was the first time I ever heard a man swear in his sleep. <laughs> Gasser keeps falling over sideways. 
And that was the way our whole career started. And about two weeks later, we met our colonel. What a magnificent man. I mean, you know, he's one of these guys. Well, I'll tell you, he was about six feet nine. I mean, you know, the kind of guy that Gary Cooper always played. He had a wedge-like waist, great big shoulders. He had these eagle eyes. And he always wore this big tin hat with a pair of big eagles on it. You know, the silver eagles. And he stands around and he looks at us all the time. Never said a word. He always wear these old D's and he wears his pants high. You know, with the leggings. And I'm standing there looking at this guy and says, oh boy, look at that. There's a real officer. Boy. And somehow you get the idea that officers live lives that are in some kind of exalted plane. I remember once in a while we'd be sitting around in Company K's barracks and they'd start talking about things about the officer world. And Edwards would say, I'll bet they don't. <laughs> and Gasser would say, what do you mean they don't? Everybody does. It's biology. <laughs> and Edwards would say, no, I don't think officers do. <laughs> so there was always an argument back and forth about things that officers did. What they did and didn't do. And they, had to, they, 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 they kind of got like gods until one day which I will never forget. I'm 17, see, and I'm really on top of it. I'm in Company K. I've worked my way up to PFC. You know, I got these two big PFC stripes, and I'm bronzed. I got my field jacket, and I'm feeding really on top of the world. And one day, I go down to the PX, and I'm looking around the PX there. I got five minutes off, and I see this case of these things you know there's all kinds of things there's stripes you can buy uh, second lieutenant bars you can buy captain's bars you know I once saw a case that had major general stars in it I once thought buy a pair you know pin them on your pajamas <laughs> You know, just do it once. You know, and oh yes, you know, and you'd see these tech sergeant stripes. And right down here, they had the thing that was going to haunt me through three years of the Army. They had a collection of pillows. Have you ever seen those pillows? They're shaped like hearts. Now this was true pop slob art. <laughs> I mean, long before pop slob art was discovered. They were made out of satin, great big hearts, and they had yellow fringe. They had a great big red heart with an arrow running through it. And on the front of this, in gold and yellow and blue and red and white letters, it said, Sweetheart, <laughs> souvenir of Camp Crowder, <laughs> Signal Corps Replacement Training Center. And over here next to it was one that said, Mother. <laughs> and over here it said, To my darling helpmeet. <laughs> Did you ever hear anyone call his wife his darling helpmeet? <laughs> I mean, that sounds like Ralph Cramsden. <laughs> you know, right out of the honeymooners. And there's this big one that says, To my darling helpmeet. From Camp Crowder. With all my love in satin. And I'm looking at this scene. You know, I'm a smart you-know-what. I wish I could say it on the radio. I look in there at that thing, see? And behind the counter is my buddy, one of my friends from the company who's been assigned to work in the PX. And I'm looking at these hearts, see? I'm walking back and forth. I say, hey, Mac! Oh, man! Oh, Jesus! Hey, look at that. Look at the one that says, to my darling, help me. Oh, God. Oh, What kind of a slob would buy that? Oh, boy. And he's going, shh. <laughs> he's hiding under the counter. I said, what's the matter with you, Mac? Look at these things. Oh, look at, look at the one with the purple fringe. 
And he's going, shh. That's right, hey, man, look at this one here with the red, look at this one's got a red heart that lights up. Can you imagine what kind of house they put that in? I'm standing there, see, and down at the other end of the counter is another GI, and he is wrapping a pillow. And standing on the other side of the counter is the colonel. And he's got this red, white, and puce. <laughs> and it says, to my darling sweetheart. And it's got a big yellow arrow through this big green heart. And he looks down at me. I'm... <laughs> Hey, you know, these are really great. <laughs> hey, uh, hey, Matt, can I have two of these? Oh, boy, are they beautiful. Did he hear me? Boy, are they beautiful. I'll have the, uh, I want the one with the, that, that funny color. You said that's called puke, puce. That's very good. Yeah, I'll have that one, the one that says sweetheart on it. I bought two pillows. <laughs> What we won't do. I'm telling you, the quality of, of lack, when you're a lackey, you're a lackey. And I bought two pillows. And I could see the colonel down there, he's wrapping his pillow up. And there's a silence. He gets his change. He looks down at me. You know, when in doubt, try to salute. <laughs> I... <laughs> he looks down. You're in my outfit, aren't you? It's no, sir. <laughs> you look familiar. I look like everybody. <laughs> Well, I found out that I don't look like everybody. <laughs> you know, I got back to the company, see, with my two pillows. <laughs> By the way, it cost me $7. Would you believe it? These things are three seventy-five each. And I put that out, you know, and I only had $8 to last me to January. <laughs> You know, I, anything to do, you know, to keep my PFC stripes. And I get back to the barracks with these two pillows. And I figure, well, I, I guess I made it. He didn't recognize me. And I stick him away in my footlock. Well, now, at that point, we had never had a footlocker inspection. And I didn't know what happened in a footlocker inspection. That Saturday, I'd forgotten completely that under my top tray... I had two pillows, one that said sweetheart and the other that said mother. <laughs> and I'm standing next to my bunk. It's the, it's the full barracks inspection. And for an hour and a half before that, we had this corporal named, I'll never forget him. I, I'll never forget him because his, his name came out in that Marlon Brando movie. Do you remember, do you remember that character Stanley? How many of you remember Stanley's last name? Kowalski. Well, I knew Kowalski in the Army. I'm not kidding. He was in my company. He was a corporal. And Kowalski was our barracks corporal. And for about an hour before our barracks inspection, he had said, Now, look, you guys. We are going to have the best barracks. You hear that? Or I'll bust you. You know what? We knew. <laughs> He had busted several in the company before that. <laughs> Three of us had him in the swing already. <laughs> he was red-haired, and all corporals, by the way, come from Tennessee. <laughs> they all do. They're all red-haired, and they're all five feet four. <laughs> you know, and they had these cut-down fatigues, jazzy, you know, all pressed. And he's walking along, and he says, all right, we're going to have the best barracks in this company. You hear me? If there is one gig, one gig, I'll restrict this barracks 
all weekend. That would mean that we could not go into the USO in Neosho. Talk about, talk about punishment. The USO in Neosho had one small pool table and a 74-year-old hostess. That was a big night in the old show. You know, to go down there and throw donuts at the old lady. <laughs> so, you know, naturally, we, we, we didn't want to miss that. So we're all scared, you know. We don't want to get gigged. So here I am standing by my barracks bunk. You know, I'm sharp. I'm standing there. Everything is polished. And in comes the colonel. He's walking along, and behind him is Kowalski with his clipboard. How many of you men have seen those clipboards in your time? Oh, yeah. Oh, I'll tell you. That clipboard, every time I see a clipboard, I'll tell you, I get a little sick feeling in my gut. They got this clipboard, see, with a pencil. And they all walk in, and automatically, somebody down at the end of the barracks hollers, A tit hut! We're standing. Oh, God. We've got to get to Neosho. <laughs> Somehow, even the rottenest things become very desirable. I mean, under certain conditions. And I began to see that little old lady. I could see her dentures smiling at me. You know, and I could taste the apple cider that she would give me. I mean, the apple cider laced with corn liquor. Oh, yeah, that was it. By the way, I must say this. One of the greatest USOs I ever went to was in the South. You know, and USOs are kind of like very clean YMCAs. I mean, really. I mean, the, 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 the most exciting thing that happens in a USO is to write a letter. That's a big moment. Well, I'm in a USO one time in Joplin, and I'm in there with Gasser. And the two of us walk up. You know, we got no money at all. And we walk up to this counter, and there's this chick standing back at the counter, and she's got a coffee machine. And she's got a jug of apple cider. And she says, would you like some coffee? Guess I says, yeah. Oh, that's a heck of a way to spend Saturday night. He says, yeah. She says, would you like some coffee, private? Yeah. She says, come here. You don't want coffee. You want the apple cider. <laughs> I said, do I? <laughs> you damn betcha you do. <laughs> and I said, I'll have apple cider. <laughs> Not that I like better than apple cider. Give me some apple cider. And she takes the apple cider jug and she pours me a little paper cup a little paper cup of apple cider about that big. She just pours it like that. And she says, here, try the apple cider. It goes down good with the donuts. And she says, and don't mention where you got it. This is a dry steak. <laughs> and so, you know, I take the apple cider, and me and Gaster sit down with the donut, and I toss it off. <laughs> I never knew I liked apple cider. Well, now, even today, when I hear, you know, when I stand in the subway and it says, yes, there is a home away from home, the USO, I think of that night that me and Gasser, after each one of us had 17 cups of apple cider, <laughs> both of us slept under the pool table, <laughs> you know, till the next morning. And so that night, you know, I came back, I'm standing there in front of my barracks, my little, my little pad there, my gut is flat, and the sergeant is walking along behind the colonel, and this guy comes in, and honestly, he really looked like Errol Flynn, but there was a sadness in his eye. It was the sadness of a man who graduated from West Point, and who always dreamed of being Eisenhower, who had dreams of being General Patton and wound up instead in Company K. And so he had a special gripe. 
And so he's walking down through the barracks, see, and I'm standing. That scared feeling. Don't let the company down. Don't do it. He walks along. Let's hear the sixth general order. Soldier. And the guy goes, ba 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 I invented general orders. <laughs> you know, if you say them fast enough, you can get by with anything. And if you say it quick enough, and if you say it with absolute assurance, you just go, ba 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 Very good. And so he's walking along, and he takes a look at me, and he stops for a minute. I'm looking at this guy's face, you see, and he's got this square-jawed face. And you always imagine an officer. If you've seen him in the movies especially, they always live on places like Park Avenue in their civilian life. And they're always married to Alexis Smith. And they live lives of gentility. And somehow I looked in this guy's eye and I saw linoleum. <laughs> Cracked Nanoli. And somehow I saw the look in the eye of a man who has seen cockroaches on the kitchen table. You know, and I could see his face, and his face had that look. It was round, and it was shaped like a heart all of a sudden. It was white and red and puce. And it says, to my darling, help me. I mean, how can you respect a guy who's got a wife who would like a pillow like that? And furthermore, how could you respect a guy who would buy a pillow like that? And he's looking me in the eye. He sees my PFC stripes. He turns to Kowalski. What's this man's name, rank, and serial number? Kowalski says, Shepard J, PFC, 16098946. Sir, he says, you're wrong. It is Shepard J, PVT. <laughs> so neat. So neatly. I was divested of the only thing I'd ever earned in my whole life. My two little stripes were gone. And he walked about three steps past my barracks bag. And he turns around, and there is my footlocker. And he says to the Kowalski, he says, Kowalski, open up man's footlocker. How would you like to have your closets open? Well, you know, I had not yet fully become the dynamic soldier I was later to become. Later, I learned the trick. You don't ever open your footlocker. You keep everything in there glued in. You don't use it at all. You have a separate pair of socks glued down there, see? Your regular socks are dirty, and your, your toothbrush has got a busted off handle. But whenever they would inspect, you would open your footlocker and everything is pristine. But at this point, you know, I thought the footlocker was like your closet. And they open it up and all my old tennis shoes fly out. You know, and my football comes out. He stands there and looks at the mess. He says, Kowalski, would you please remove the tray? And you know, the tray. Underneath was where the really rotten stuff was. <laughs> I had dirty books. <laughs> I mean, you know. <laughs> and I looked him right in the eye, and somehow there was a note that went between the two of us. 
the note said, you better not. <laughs> because right under the tray were two big pillows. One that said, sweetheart, and the other that said, mother. And he looked me in the eye and he said, uh, Kowalski, forget it. I said, yes, sir. He walked down a little further and he said something to Kowalski. They got about 20 feet further on. Kowalski comes walking back to me and whispers in my ear. He says, Shepard, I don't know what you got on him. He just made you corporal. <laughs> and that's how a young man gets ahead in this army. And somewhere out in the darkness is a man working in a Tom McCann shoe shop my ex-colonel 